Well, a warm welcome again. Through this past few weeks, Gert, Conradi and I have been taking a look at some of the possible pitfalls and gremlins which can impact on the coating aspects of a project. And I think today we finally got to the point where we can spend some time where we look at the actual coating process itself. So Gert, I'm thinking about challenges because of pumps and spray nozzles not working, dripping from brushes and nozzles. What kind of problems do you think are common? And then we can start answering the question of how do we mitigate those problems? Okay, the way that you described it is the, the perfect worksite. You know, when you go to the worksite, that's what you see, dripping paint of brushes and leaking tips and spray guns that don't work and paint that doesn't want to dry. So yeah, where do we start? And you know, like any good cake that you want to bake, you need to start with a recipe. And I think the best place to start is to actually look at a stand. And there is a standard out there for shop, field, and maintenance coatings for materials that you place onto metals called mm -hmm. SSPCPA1. And it's actually a standard that provides the basic requirements and it gives best practices for the application process of the protective coating system to previously coated paint systems, if it's maintenance, or even uncoated metallic substrates. Okay. So it is intended to be used by not only specifiers, but mainly by contractors and by applicators to see how they can apply the coating properly. And the scope of the specification includes specific as well as general requirements that you need for the application of a liquid coating by means of a roller, a brush, spray gun, and it actually goes deeper into that. This is the actual standard for ECSPCPA1. And as you can see there, it specifically relates to shop field and maintenance coatings. Then it references other standards that you need to go through. But as you go through here, it's a very good reference guide to follow that gives you definitions. There's a lot of times when we talk about a checked coating or a run or a sag, uh, or we talk about a pinhole or pot life, people don't understand the terminology. And this is just a quick guide that you can go to. So not only does it start with that, but it even gives you the requirements that you need, for instance, for the type of brush application that you should use or how to brush over welds, or various different other types. Here you can see brush application. It starts off by saying how it should actually be manufactured, because you get cheap brushes, and you get proper <laughs> brushes. And if you don't use the right one and the right job, your solvent could be so strong in your coating system that it makes the brush fall apart. So again, this is a good guide to follow in order for you to help. But not only does it do that, if I go to the last page, you can see uh, all the other standards that it references over here. And when you refer to any of these, you can now select the type of coating to make sure, is it the right type? And how do I apply it? So, Gert, would you say that would be a worthwhile investment for the engineer to have um, as part of his arsenal? Most definitely. Most definitely that's something that, that he needs to have in his arsenal, if I can put it that way. What I've now clicked on here is another manual. And as you can see by the page numbers, 791 pages. So this is for painting manual and it gives you everything that you require for a successful job. And again, I think yeah, it's important for us to realize that proper QC on the job, mm -hmm. having an inspector that has read through these or understand the basics of it, to be able to apply it in the field, whether it be a third party inspector or somebody that's been appointed by the client or the contract, it's important for them to understand all of this documentation. We don't have enough time to go through all <laughs> 700 pages, but the point being the challenges that are out there, even though you've got all of these standards that are available, is how to set up the equipment. And that's mm -hmm. where the applicator that's well experienced comes in versus the, if I may call it the fly-by-night guy that just quickly came in. So he'll ask the right questions. Can my coating be applied by a roller or a brush? If we think of certain coatings that cure very quickly, you know, some of those coatings cure within a couple of seconds. You're still going to be trying to use a brush and lift the whole paint and up with it type of thing. You know, again, zinc is one coating that you can't uh, use a brush or a roller in order to apply it. Then when we look at other equipment, you get specialized equipment like plural component spray systems, polyurethanes and, and epoxies. Now you need to look at other avenues like temperatures and pressures. If you don't apply those temperatures and pressures properly, the coating is not going to atomize, it's not going to mix properly, 
and you're going to have a failure that's going to occur. And this is not to say that that temperature only applies to those coatings. That temperature control is very important throughout the entire range of paint systems that's available. You made reference just now to an experienced applicator, and I fully understand why we need to train up applicators. So sometimes you will have an inexperienced applicator because part of the training process happens to be your project. But one of the concerns that I've observed is where the applicator shakes his head and then says, mm, this is too thick and throws in whatever's in the drum next to him to thin the coating so that it sprays more easily. Let's discuss some of the risks of that action of, quote, thinning the coating. I like to refer to this as the lacquer experience that people do because the lacquer thinners is the thing that people chuck in. So exactly like you've mentioned, but we need to realize that some of the coatings are formulated to chemically crosslink. You know, say you've got an A and a B component and they're carefully manufactured in a laboratory under those conditions so that they crosslink and they react with one another, like polyurethane or an epoxy. But what's important is they must use the manufacturer's correct thinners. If they don't use the correct thinners, they upset this whole chemical reaction that's now taking place. And that, that can really lead to a failure down the line. If you add thinners at the end of the pot life or at the beginning of the pot life, this is now another thing that we can maybe discuss. Well, I think pot life itself is something that we need to, to talk about. If my understanding is correct, the pot life is the chemically determined length of time that you have that you can apply during that time. And if you apply outside of the pot life, you're actually not going to get a coating that adheres because although it may still be runny, say the polymerization process has already completed. And so your coating just won't stick. The, the problem is by adding this lacquer thinners or thinners that they add in, even if it's the correct manufacturer's system, you might dilute the mixture. Mm -hmm. But now we're looking at a, a masked mixture. So it, it gives the appearance that you've made it thinner, but what you've actually done is you've now extended the pot life in, in what you see physically in the pot, but you've also stalled or reacted or changed this polymerization that has taken place. And this can lead to other defects down the line. One of the really important things to remember with adding thinners is first, if at all possible, don't. Secondly, you must make sure that the thinners available for use is only the matching component for that system. And in fact, good housekeeping would mean to remove anything that could be added accidentally because that's just going to exacerbate the problem. And I, I guess one of the other challenges is that if you're adding thinners to your coating system, when you take a wet film thickness with that little wet film comb that uh, contractors often use, you're not going to get the thickness you expect from the wet film that you've just measured if you've add a dilute to it, because obviously now I've got fewer solids, so you're going to get a thinner final coating. Yes, most definitely. And I think we spoke about that in our, in our first series with the bite size corrosion as to how you can use the product data sheet and look at the volume solids that's available and calculate once you have added the recommended amount of thinners that you are then gonna get the paint to dry to the recommended dry film thickness. But you need to keep in mind that you have to sometimes apply or add thinners into the coating system. So a lot of times people look at it and they say, oh, it's thin enough, it's okay. I'm, I'm happy with the way that it looks or the applicator says, I'm happy with spraying it the way it is. But you need to add in the thinners to make it atomized properly. Mm -hmm. Also for the product to flow out on top of your profile surface for the coating to adhere properly. And we pick that up sometimes when you do dolly pull-offs, when you've added thinners versus not adding thinners, that adding the correct amount of thinners on the dolly pull will give you a higher yield strength than what the one had that didn't have it in because it didn't wet out over the surface properly. But also, as you've mentioned, going over the recommended ratios uh, means that your paint form is now not going to dry to the specific DFT that you want. Because now you've added more thinners, so your wet form measures correctly, but it dries to below what is required. And again, this, this just upsets the whole formation 
um, of the paint film on top of the surface. There are so many similarities between the coating application thinking and baking. You would never bake a cake or a bread by just arbitrarily picking up and throwing in whatever you felt like. We always follow a recipe, otherwise we know it'll flop. And I guess the takeaway for me is when on site in a coating project, follow the recipe. The coating companies have spent many thousands of hours formulating their coatings so that the chemical formulations are correct. And just as you wouldn't throw different ingredients into a cake, so please don't throw different ingredients into the coating itself. And just tied with that, I think before we move off this, uh, what we add and what we don't add is, is partially adding A and B if you've got a two component system. It's very tempting to say, oh, well, I don't need the full amount. So I'll just add, well, that looks about right. And so I'll just add approximately the same amount. And I've seen some of the ratios are like 8.33 to 16.444 or whatever. And that's really complicated ratios. You would need a really accurate device to mix appropriately. So don't just like I at and add a third of a tin of each without making sure you're adding the correct quantities and mixing them thoroughly. For sure. You know, a lot of times we look at um, sites and when we go there as an engineer, um, you see the applicators doing the work that they arbitrarily do every single day. You know, so we like to refer to it as a glug method. So he says, how much thinness must I, oh, well, glug, 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 maybe three glugs is enough. And a lot of them are good at it. They've got 20 years experience of measuring glugs up to 100 milliliters accuracy. But you don't always get that. And talking about ratios just quickly, there's two differences. You get volume to ratios and you get weight ratios. Your components are different weights because they've got different, different specific gravities. So if you just say, okay, I'm going to weigh it uh, four to one, so I'm going to take four kilograms to one kilogram, you might be upsetting that ratio completely because it's volume-based and not weight-based. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing to also recognize. Sort of heading away from our recipe now, we've briefly discussed the challenges with pot life. But I do know a number of people get confused between the different terms, things like induction, pot life, drying, curing. So let's have a look at those terms and just try and iron out any confusion in them so that they don't become gremlins in the system. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people only look at the pot life side of things and say, how long have I got to work with the paint? But we need to start with the induction time or sometimes referred to as a sweat in time. And this is the time that you need to elapse once you've taken the A and the B components, if it's a two component system and you've mixed the two together before you start applying it on the surface. And if you don't stick to that sweat in time, what's going to happen is that that cross linking hasn't sufficiently happened inside the coating formulation. And, and that's why they give it a certain time period to react. Now you spray it on the surface and you get areas that are tacky and areas that are cracking, areas that are dull versus areas that are shiny. And the reason for that is because they've adhered to their pot life, but they haven't adhered to the sweating time or the chemical reaction to take place. And it's so, so important that at this point in time that they refer to the technical data sheet to say, what is my sweating time? What is my induction time before I'm allowed to start using the actual paint system? Well, you mentioned yesterday, about using an ITP as well as your QCP. So on that QCP or in your plan of, of action, make sure that that's a line item. We need to wait between the time we've mixed A and B and starting, we've got to wait 20 minutes. And if it's helpful, write down the time so that you can check that you did leave the 20 minutes because 20 minutes is incredibly long if you're waiting and it goes instantly if you're busy and you, you don't want time to go. So we're not good generally as humans in measuring time instinctively. Using our watches is probably the better option. Yeah, most definitely. I think the important thing here is to almost be like an athletics coach. You know, you need to have your stopwatch with you. You say, okay, start at mixing now, stop mixing now. And yeah, then something else that one needs to look at is obviously like the temperatures. It's, it's very, very important. So I think temperatures is probably quite a, a vast thing. I just feel that we haven't spoken yet about drying and curing 
thoroughly. So we've spoken about induction, we've spoken about pot life. Uh, drying versus curing, if, it, if I touch it and it's dry, is it cured? Will it be cured and not dry? Well, it might appear. And, and that's the difference between the two. And just bringing out and emphasizing the point again, when we spoke about sweetening times or induction time and pot life, um, and I quickly touched on it now, both of these are critical components to watch your temperature. If you don't watch your temperature, it's going to set off quicker or take longer than what is required. And the same goes for drying versus curing. I've got a, um, a chart that's now talking about an epoxy specifically, but this will give you a good idea that what you're looking at, it is not a linear graph. So it's a actual negative exponential graph. So that means that the higher the temperature goes, the shorter your liquid time or your pot life is going to be. So you have less time to work with it. And the same thing goes for the cure. For an epoxy system, it goes from a liquid to a gel to a solid state. And as you can see on this chart here, as you increase temperature, you decrease the actual time that takes place. So what we're looking at here is now that your, your actual minimum time is required versus your requirement as per the technical data sheet. Again, it's that exponential negative chart that you're looking at. The higher the temperature, the shorter the time. And this is very important to note here. You've got a minimum recommended working temperature that you need to adhere to. So as your temperature increases, look at the stopwatch, look at the temperature and be in control to see, can we continue using the paint? Yes or no. And obviously as cold, the colder it gets on an epoxy system, it might not even react. It might not solidify, but it can stop curing for that point in time. So to come back to the question that you had, drying time versus curing time, that's when we look at this drying stage, which might be a gel stage, but it still hasn't gone to the solid film that protects mm. the substrate. And that solid film is your cure stage. And as you can see there, from liquid to gel, there's quite a long period of time mm. that can take place. It could be days for the coating to actually dry before it starts fully curing and providing a protective coating over the substrate. Just talking about this temperature variations versus the drying and curing times, it seems to me that it would possibly be a good idea to put together a little bit of a, a graph for your project site. I know that on the data sheets, they often give, say, in 10 degrees intervals or 20 degree intervals, they are usually 10 degree intervals. And, and you can just plot that uh, on Excel on a piece of graph paper. It doesn't have to be fancy to get an indication of how long you've got. And especially, I think, across our country in the summer months, the curing times and the pot life times can be very short because our ambient temperature is so incredibly high. And in winter time, we need to make sure, especially with the more sensitive products, that we actually at our ambient temperatures will even get cure happening. And if we won't, that would be the time where the contractor needs to draw the engineer's attention to it to perhaps look at an alternative product. Correct. And what you need to keep in mind, and we've, we've touched on it there, is the fact that you can use a coating system in the workshop, in the shop. Mm -hmm. And it's going to work perfectly there because your conditions are controlled. You're sitting at 25 degrees Celsius or 28 degrees Celsius, your coating is loving it. It's where the, the laboratory guys, when they designed it, they didn't go and design it to work out in the field. But now you go and use exactly the same paint system, but apply it in Uppington, where your temperatures on a daily basis could exceed 40 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. You've now doubled that point in time that you need for this coating to be sufficiently cured. So in other words, you've halved what you need to do. And it's always safer. And I think a question that came through when we were discussing the technical data sheets, if your data sheet is all that you have to work on and you've got 5, 10, 20, 25, 30, 35 degrees Celsius, and that's all that you can, can gauge your coating system on, rather go to the one that's a little bit more instead of the one that's less so that you give yourself time to work with. So if you're sitting at 27 degrees, which is like midway between 25 and 30, rather use the scale that's on the 30 because that will give you your safe factor to work with in order to apply the coating system properly. 
And I think it's also fair to say that it's a good idea to make the coating manufacturer your friend. Get them on the blower. Get hold of their technical department and ask them. We're sitting in wherever it is, Uppington or wherever. It's extremely hot. We're using product X. The data sheet goes up to 30 degrees. What is your recommendation? Get it from them because they know their products rather than guessing based on some other experience, which may or may not be applicable for that specific coating. Most definitely. It's super important that you adhere to the data sheet. And if you're unclear about any information on it, as you've mentioned, phone the guys that manufacture it. They know how to work with it. They might suggest you use a different thinners because you're using different temperatures. One that, that cures quicker might need a slower evaporating coating system. And, mm -hmm. and so forth. You know, so it's very important to contact them and not try and rely on your field chemistry and say, I know how to do this and then end up with a failure. And then the other challenge, I missed something when I was coating and now I need to overcoat to fix my blups. What are the cautions that we need to be aware of when we're looking at overcoating? Again, temperature, temperature and time. As soon as you see that your coating has started setting off before you apply your next coat on top of it, you need to know that it's still chemically active. So if it is cured and you're now going to try and put a coating system on it, you're going to have adhesion failure between those two coating systems. If you put it on too soon and you haven't allowed enough time for the solvents to flash off, you're going to get solvent entrapment, which can cause bubbles and blisters or voids inside your coating. So again, it's so important to stick to the data sheet and stick to the recommendations that they've given you to say overcoating is within six hours. And bear in mind that some of that overcoating can only take place after seven to 10 to 14 days because mm -hmm. those coatings need to cure by moisture that needs to be absorbed into the coating. They're moisture cured coatings and they need a longer time, especially up here in the high felt where our humidities are, are relatively very low. You need that coating to cure sufficiently before you put something on it. Otherwise, you're going to sit with the failure. Great, Kurt. I think that we've really looked at some of the key elements associated with actually getting the coating onto the steel structure. And one of the things that any good coating applicator will want is for somebody to inspect the quality of his work. Obviously, in-house quality is really important, but I think there is also value in the independent coating inspector making sure that the correct data is being recorded so that there is a record into the future of what was experienced during the application process. Most definitely, you know, I'd like to also just mention that we call these third party inspectors our traffic ops on the highway. You tend to want to stick to what the speed limit is because you know it's 120 and that orange and white car, or white car sitting down the road with a somebody that's holding a trigger and he's just ready to catch you. And a third party inspector is exactly that. He's there not to find you, but to point out that you are deviating from whatever the specification, product data sheet or application method is. Yeah, and that's super important that, that you get this independent second set of eyes that's not part of whoever you are or involved in. So you don't overlook certain things that's so important.